Thank you, Jessica. And thank you for having me here. It's a great honor to uh, be here in Bath in the UK. And uh, today's keynote will be about the role of parents uh, of our research lab, but also of the clinic, research of the clinic, looking specifically also at the role of fathers. So I'd first like to thank my whole uh, team. You see predominantly female team who's been working with me for 10 years on studying the role of uh, uh, parents and fathers versus uh, mothers. And as you could see, some of the uh, female researchers became pregnant during the uh, study and we used their babies to actually uh, as pilot babies to test out our procedures because our rule was always if they didn't want to do it with their own babies, these were not good procedures to do with anybody else, his baby. So thanks to the babies, they're now big children already for helping us out. So starting uh, uh, with child anxiety, babies are born anxious and some of course more than others and anxiety is important. Uh, but too much anxiety can interfere with um, learning. And parents can be the ones who can help uh, children overcome this um, first anxieties. And all of us who've had babies know how vulnerable and anxious babies can be at the beginning and how important the role of parents then um, seems. Um, Talking about child anxiety disorders, so when there is persistent anxiety which lasts more than six months um, and really interferes with children's uh, functioning, we talk about anxiety disorders. Anxiety disorders are the most uh, prevalent mental disorders in children as well as in adults. Uh, they run into families and they breed through from parents to children. However, we don't know how they be breathe through and uh, through whom? Is it through the father or through the mother? So when I started thinking about the role of uh, fathers, I got this uh, citation from Talia Eli. It's from a British writer in the 1900s and it says, my mother protected me against the world and my father threatened me with it. And that's uh, exactly, I think, what the basic difference is between maybe between mothers and fathers in the role in helping children overcome uh, anxieties. And for example, when I was thinking about this research, I was walking my children who were at that time still small and I was walking them to school and suddenly I saw a father behind the wall going like this. And then his two little girls kind of uh, walked by and then he went like, wow, and he really kind of the, the children were completely started, startled, and I thought, wow, well, I've never seen a mom bring her children to school like that. And then at another occasion, I was um, in the park with my children, I suddenly saw a man, you know, with a stroller with his baby, and then at some point, he left the baby there with a the stroller, and he just walked, kind of walked on, and then, and then the baby was going, papa, 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 and he just kept walking, and I heard the baby scream, and then he walked, backwards and kind of fell over the stroller and they were both really laughing. And again, these are the kind of things that you see fathers do with the babies and you don't see mothers do it so much. And the question is why? Maybe they have a different role to play here. However, if you look at the research into uh, the role of parents in child anxiety and child development in general, it's really dominated by research on mothers. And the question is why fathers have been ignored in research. So first, it can be that mothers really matter more. But of course, that's an untested assumption. And as scientists, we need to test those assumptions. The second is that mothers spend more time with their children. That's true. That's even true in the current generation. But it doesn't mean that spending more time necessarily means having more impact. For example, if you think about child abuse, can have huge impact and it's not related to how much time you spend with those children. Um, and another reason is that fathers, because they're less home with their mom, with their children, they may be out 
in the world doing other things and as a result giving very important examples to those children when they're not around. For example, the signal that the world is safe and that you can go out of the house. Another reason why we tend to involve moms in research is because they are easier to involve, or at least we think so. And so the studies that did involve fathers often have 30 to 50% of the fathers missing. And so if you think about that, what fathers you think are missing in those studies? What do you think? What fathers would not show up in the study if you have 30 to 50% of fathers missing? Okay, yeah, so that, that may be one type of father, yeah. Other fathers that may be missing might be, for example, divorced fathers who are not uh, so much involved in child care any longer. Uh, fathers who are very busy and therefore don't uh, come, who can't combine it with the work because it's during the day, or fathers who are very anxious. And so all those fathers, if you miss them, you may not have valid uh, conclusions of your research. So the problems with a dominant uh, mother approach is that uh, parents form a dynamic system and for example if we study the role of overprotective mothers, behind an overprotective mother may be an absent father that kind of drives the overprotection of the mom. And even our father, if fathers are included in the research, often their roles are measured um, around models that have been developed um, uh, more for mothers. For example, attachment is a typical, more female mother model of uh, child involvement. So the mothers haven't distinguished possible paternal or maternal functions. And so fathers and mothers, up still to this day, may be different in some ways. For example, in this picture you see uh, if the child doesn't come home at night, the adolescent moms may be more worried and more wake up more often than fathers will do. And so if you look at developmental research up to today, uh, first moms hold their babies more often than fathers, and if they do so, moms do it more for care, feeding and protection, and fathers do it more for play, and for kind of challenging play. And so evolutionary, fathers and mothers uh, have specialized differently. Men more, if you look at like 2,000 years ago, more in external environments, in dangerous animals, uh, conquering dangerous animals, uh, approaching unfamiliar humans and competition. Whereas um, uh, women have specialized more in internal tasks such as care and soothing. And Therefore, we hypothesize in this research that children may rely more on their fathers when it comes on insight uh, on the external world, like is uh, uh, a new uh, a novel stimuli, is that an opportunity or a threat? And so when I started this research, I spent a lot of time finding funny pictures on the internet. And so the hypothesis is that children may overcome their fears by the example of an interaction action with a confident, courageous and risk-taking father who challenges them. And of course, this is a hypothesis to be tested. So the first thing we did is we did a meta-analysis where specifically for young children, so children zero to five, and we looked at evidence for um, uh, the role, so research that it did involve fathers for different roles in fathers and mothers. We found that um, over-involvement and over-control was not related, not associated with uh, child, young child's anxiety, but over-protection was, as you see, for the moms, it had an association of 0.12, and for the fathers, an association of 0.20, which is not significant for fathers, but there were only three uh, studies there, whereas for mom there's, there were 11 studies. So here you see this quantitative difference between the number of studies on fathers and mothers. And then we looked at challenging uh, parenting behavior. There were two studies at a time um, uh, looking at that, and for fathers we find 
a significant association between that more challenging behavior of the father is related to less child anxiety and for mom we don't find that indication so that was the first um, indication that uh, fathers may play a different role in child anxiety than mothers. Then we did a second study um, using the visual cliff. Uh, you will all know this uh, procedure, but we used it in a specific way. We had half of the babies had to cross a vis visual cliff with a mom kind of saying, come here, come here, it's not dangerous. And the other half did it with the father saying, come here, come here. And we looked at the uh, difference between mothers and fathers. So this is the model for the mothers. What we found is that whether the child will um, uh, go over the cliff or avoid the cliff is entirely predicted by the child's own anxious temperament in, um, in interaction with the mom. But then look at the model for the father something very different is here. So here the infant's avoidance of the cliff is predicted by father's express anxiety. So if the father expresses a lot of anxiety, the child will avoid. Um, but also the interaction between the father's express anxiety and the kind of by nature anxious temperament of the baby predict that the child will uh, more often avoid the cliff. So this is another indication that uh, fathers may have a different role to play in child anxiety than mothers. And so then I would like to share with you the results of 10 years of longitudinal research that we did on the role of fathers and mothers and both parents together in uh, helping the children overcome uh, anxiety. And so we started with uh, 149 parent couples who were pregnant from their first baby. And we looked only at first babies because research shows that first children are more influenced by parental behavior and we wanted to have maximum influence by parents and not so much the influence of siblings. So before birth, we uh, assessed the anxiety and anxiety disorders in both the parents. And then on the next assessments, we um, assessed the physiology of the child the behavior inhibition of the child, uh, child self-consciousness, parenting, social reference, parenting behavior, social referencing, I, I'll, I'll give more examples of that later, how we measure that, and co-parenting. And we measured all those behaviors in the lab, at home, at the families, and we looked at fathers and mothers uh, separate, and also at then at the triangulation, so father, mother, and child all together. And I don't have the time to present all the results, but I'll focus on the mains. We did it up to the age of four and a half. We did it in this uh, family lab uh, that was uh, fully designed by the university in order for families to feel safe and come back. Uh, and then uh, when the children were older, we needed a bigger lab because then they also we had a kind of Tarzan-like things hanging on the wall where the parents could swing with their uh, children, so we uh, went to a somewhat larger lab with more possibilities for play. And so these are the total number of measurements with, that we did. You, say, you can see, for me, this is a study, you do it only once in a lifetime because it was a lot of work uh, to do this, and many, many people have been working hard to get this data ready. And so then the first question we ask ourselves is, is there actually, is there intergenerational transmission of anxiety? So is it the case that if parents have anxiety disorders before the child is born, that later we can see then that those children are more anxious? And the, result, the answer is yes. Um, we found that parental anxiety and anxiety disorders predict child anxiety uh, disorder symptoms up to four and a half years and seven and a half years of age of these children. However, it wasn't the case that father's anxiety would predict child anxiety more than mother's anxiety, so there was no interaction with gender. And um, the fact that we found this, of course, can be purely genetic effect. It doesn't say anything yet about the role of post, uh, of uh, uh, 
parental behavior. So the next question we want to answer is, is there intergenerational transmission of risk factors for child anxiety and child anxiety disorders? And we looked at different risk factors. The answer was yes. So the first risk factors we looked at was uh, the physiology of the child. So we looked at heart rate and we found that parental anxiety and anxiety disorders measured prenatally, so before the baby was born, predicts the heart rate, but not the heart rate variability at four months of the baby. So it means that if the parents had anxiety disorder before birth, the baby at four months has a higher heart rate when it's um, exposed with um, uh, things like mobiles, ethanol smell, noise, and approach by a stranger, and doing white noise habituation tasks. And interesting, this higher heart rate of the baby predicted more negative reactivity in novel situations and more behavior inhibition, so a tendency to kind of avoid novelty. We also looked at more um, indications of arousal related to social anxiety. So we looked at whether parents' social anxiety disorders, again, uh, measured um, prenatally, whether that predicts blushing and sweating in the child when it sings on stage at the age of four and a half. And I'll show you... Um, Uh, parent social anxiety disorders predict how much these children blush. You could see we measure that on the cheek and how much they sweat it uh, during singing on stage at the age of four and a half. And also parent social anxiety disorders predicted um, how much the children sweated while approaching a stranger at the age of two and a half and four and a half. And this blushing and sweating of the children at two and a half and four and a half uh, predicted more social anxiety in these children at seven and a half years after controlling for their earlier social anxiety. So you see here connection from parent social anxiety disorder to physiological responses of the child in social tasks to child social anxiety symptoms later on. Okay? And the last study on the risk factors is about attentional bias as a risk factor. This study just came out showing that uh, parents' own anxiety disorders, um, sorry, not at four and a half years, yeah, yeah, measured when a child was four and a half years of age. It predicts uh, children's attentional bias to threat using a visual search task at seven and a half years and again after controlling for child anxiety. So this is a visual search, search task where they have to find an angry face in a happy crowd and a happy face in an angry crowd. And whether that will predict um, social anxiety later on is a question for further research. So the next question we asked was, uh, do these parental anxiety disorders actually predict the way parents raise their children? And the answer was, Yes and no. So first, yes, if we look at a number of social referencing tasks, and I will give you a few video examples of those in a minute. So social referencing task is where children um, need to, uh, are confronted with novel stimuli, like a robot they've never seen or a strange person. And then the parent's task is to help the child approach the stranger or the strange uh, robot. And so we look at the approach behavior or the avoidance behavior of the child, but we also look at parents express anxiety and whether the parent models in a positive way how to approach this robot or this child, and so whether the parent encourages the child to uh, do the task. And we found that parents' own anxiety disorder predicts how anxious the anxiety signals that they give to their children when uh, they are confronted with a robot or um, a strange uh, person 
at one years of age, two and a half years of age, four and a half years of age, and seven and a half years of age. So very cons consistently, when parents have own anxiety disorders, they are less able to actually uh, stimulate their child to, um, um, ex to approach novel stimuli. The last robot that you see here to the right, we call it Scary Harry. So that's the robot that we developed for the age of seven and a half years of age. He makes funny sounds, has a skeleton, and uh, we all uh, were very fond of him. As I already talked about a paternal challenging, uh, sorry, at maternal and paternal challenging and overprotective behavior. So we measured at all these different ages, we measured whether the fathers and the mothers were challenging uh, their children in structured play tasks and unstructured play tasks um, and whether they were overprotecting uh, their children. We found that fathers' own anxiety disorders predict how challenging and how challenging he is with his child at the age of one, two and a half, four and a half and seven and a half years. So again, a very consistent um, result. And for mothers, we didn't find that her own anxiety disorder predicted less challenging behavior. For both parents, for moms and fathers, we found that their anxiety disorders predicted overprotection at the age of one, two and a half, four and a half, and seven and a half years of age. But of course the question is then, so um, parents' anxiety disorder predict their parenting behavior, but then is, of course the question is, does this parenting behavior then predict uh, child anxiety? Does it matter for children how, ch how parents behave? And the first question was, whether does it matter for all children? So whether they are anxious or not, not anxious, does it matter? The answer is yes. We found that um, less challenging and less over, and funny enough, so that's against all hypothesis, less challenging and less overprotective behavior at one and two and a half years predicts more child anxiety at two and a half and four and a half years. And challenging, especially so in fathers, and less overprotection, especially so in mothers. So this is, the last thing is really against prediction. So if a mom is overprotective with her child, that actually predicts less anxiety development in their child later on. So it doesn't seem to be a bad behavior. And so more challenging behavior, especially in a father, predicted also less development of anxiety. We also found that uh, when parents were doing this social referencing task, when they were, um, uh, that their parental uh, signals predicted subsequent child anxiety and avoidance of the stranger, but we didn't find that for the robot. So when the parents model anxious behavior to the child, the child will be more anxious and more avoidant. And there seems to be a specific age where this is the case, namely when the parents do this, when the child is one and two and a half years of age, we didn't find the effect anymore at four and a half or seven and a half years of age. So it's really early parenting here. The next question then was, do parents matter for some? So specifically for anxious children, because you could imagine that if a child is very confident, it doesn't really matter whether the parent shows anxious sig signals or not. But if the child is anxious, it may matter. The answer was yes. So on this social referencing task, we found that if children were high in behavior inhibition, so had an inclination, a predisposition to avoid novel stimuli, those children are more anxious and more avoidant towards a stranger um, and have more anxiety disorder symptoms later on at four and a half years when their parents have signaled more anxiety to them at one year and two and a half year during social referencing tasks. So yes, when children have an anxious predisposition, it does matter uh, how parents uh, stimulate them or show anxious signals in novel situation with novel strangers. 
And yes, we found that especially for children with a high anxious temperament, uh, father's uh, challenging behavior matters. So those children tend to develop less anxiety later on when their father has been more challenging with them early on. So the question was then, do fathers have a different role than mothers? The answer was, again, yes. We found so that especially fathers' challenging behavior decreased later child anxiety. But however, mothers can compensate. So when the father is not very challenging and the mother is highly challenging, the children also don't uh, develop uh, anxiety. On the social referencing task, we didn't find a different role for fathers and mothers. We found that both fathers and mothers' anxious signals matters in similar degrees. However, the fact that fathers spend less time with their children, certainly when the children are young, didn't make the didn't make a difference. So father's anxious signals do matter. So the conclusion of this series of studies were that parents' anxiety disorders do predict child anxiety. Uh, they predict risk factors for child anxiety like physiological indicators of anxiety, uh, like heart rate, uh, higher heart rate, blushing, sweating, and attentional bias. They protect overprotective and challenging parenting, and they, protect, they predict uh, parental anxious modeling. Both parents' anxious modeling actually predict child anxiety, but only the anxious modeling at an early age, so at one and two and a half years of age. So there seems to be a sensitive period. And specifically, father's challenging parenting predicts less child anxiety later on, but mothers can compensate for less challenging father by being more challenging. Also, we found that parental uh, behavior uh, predicts child anxiety, especially in those children who have high behavior inhibition, so who are uh, um, uh, anxious to approach novel stimuli. And here we found that specifically paternal challenging and both parents anxious modeling during social referencing was um, uh, on influence for children with a high behavior inhibition. And finally, against all hypotheses, we found that overprotection, especially in mothers, predicts less anxiety and so appears to be adaptive behavior. So I realize that these conclusions are partially still preliminary because they're not all published. Uh, yet, and so the research will be continued. And for the last part of this um, talk, I would like to talk more about the role of parents in treatment. Oh, so, sorry, first the implication of this research. So, um, uh, first, I think it's important to do more research on this concept of parental challenging behavior because it measures something different as the opposite of overprotection and it seems to predict child anxiety. Uh, next, psychoeducation about fathers' unique and essential role in raising children uh, to both fathers and mothers would be a, a good idea to prevent child anxiety. And for research as well as clinicians, don't forget the busy outside in the world fathers, the divorced fathers, and the anxious fathers to include them in research and in your clinic. But to then go on to treatment. So even if child anxiety is caused or maintained by parental behavior, the question is still, do we need parents to cure their child's anxiety disorder? You see? That's a different question to ask. And actually, whether it's important or not to include parents in child anxiety disorder treatment may be dependent on the effectiveness of the child treatment itself, on the age of the child, or on whether the parents have anxiety or not. And so I'm going to take you through these three uh, 
questions and the results are quite, again, unexpected. So I'll present the result of a somewhat older study um, we did in 2008, where we looked at um, child cognitive behavior treatment for children with anxiety disorder versus a family form of cognitive behavior treatment, where we would involve both parents, so both the father and the mother, and uh, learn them techniques to help their child overcome anxiety and work on their own um, overprotective uh, behavior. And these were the children in this study, there were 128 uh, children aged 8 to 17. Uh, here you see they were quite severe in terms of, uh, typically they had an average of three anxiety disorders and uh, quite a high uh, clinician severity rating 7.8 on a scale of 0 to 8 in terms of severity of anxiety. And here you see the prevalence of the primary anxiety disorder. So most of them had social anxiety disorder, then separation anxiety, then generalized anxiety, then specific phobias, and then panic disorder. So as always, we really tried, we did our very, very best to have both fathers and mothers included. For example, my research assistant called me at some point and she said, I found a father, he lives in Curaçao. Uh, can I get a plane ticket from the research grant to uh, fly there to interview him? So they really did their best to get all the fathers and the mothers in. In the end, we had 126 mothers in the study. Two mothers didn't participate. One had died and one because of very severe social anxiety disorder. 117 fathers participated, 11 didn't, uh, five because they had died, um, one was homeless and couldn't be chased, um, detected, one had language problems, one uh, was drug addicted, and three because of lack of motivation. So here we look at um, results at uh, post-test, so the treatment consisted of 12 weeks child-focused CBT without parental involvement versus 12 weeks family CBT. So working with a child, working with the parents, working with a whole family in the best way we thought. And the hypothesis was that the family CBT would be better. However, we found exactly the opposite. So at post-test, uh, something like around, oh, here you have the precise numbers. Uh, at post-test, um, only 28% of the children were free of all anxiety disorders in the uh, family treatment versus 53% in the child alone treatment. This difference was not any longer significant at eight week follow up, but was again significant at one year follow up. So clearly the treatment for the child alone was more effective and it was highly effective. So it wasn't that the family CBT didn't work at all, but the child CBT really worked better. So also on other measures, a similar uh, pattern. Here you see the child anxi the anxiety symptoms rated by the child itself and the uh, child anxiety symptoms rated by the parent. And the pattern is similar as here with the a percentage of children free of diagnosis of anxiety disorders. So the next question was that, then, would family CBT then be more effective if the child is of younger age and if the parents have anxiety disorders themselves? So the hypothesis for younger age children, family CBT would be better and for parents with anxiety disorders, family CBT would be better. Uh, the opposite trend uh, came about. So for adolescents, family CBT um, worked uh, better, but for children, so 8 to 12, uh, child-focused CBT was really the best treatment. And for parents without anxiety disorders, family CBT worked well, but for parents with anxiety disorders, very clearly the child CBT only so not involving the parents was a better uh, treatment. Then we looked at parents' own primary diagnosis. So only for those parents who had a diagnosis, and most of them had anxiety disorder or they had depression, 
And again, of course, the hypothesis was that the parents who had gone into the family CBT would be more often free of their own primary diagnosis. And again, we found the opposite, at least for the moms. We found that more moms, like 60% of the moms were cured when they were not involved in the child treatment versus only 30% if they were involved in the treatment, so in the family-focused treatment. Whereas for fathers, there was no difference in um, their, on their own diagnosis, whether the child got their individual treatment or they got the family CBT. So you see also on parental anxiety disorders, uh, child CBT seems to be better, especially for the mom. Then we wanted to know which treatment was more cost effective. And here you can, of course, already guess the answer. The child-focused treatment was more cost effective also because it costs less, because you need to involve less people there. Um, uh, and we looked here at uh, the outcome of anxiety in the whole family. So the anxiety disorder in the treated child, but also in the siblings and also on the parents. So on anxiety in the whole family, again, individual treatment for the child who was referred with an anxiety disorder was the best uh, treatment to give. So you may think this study is an outlier compared to other studies, but it's not. So we look here at a recent meta-analysis done in Norway by a group, oh sorry, in Sweden, by a, a group from Lars Göring Oost. Um, and he looked at 18 studies on child-only treatment versus uh, treatment involving the parents of the fa or the family. Um, so these were the number of studies, the number of children, the ages of the children, the gender of the children. And the result was that there was a borderline significant better outcome for the child-focused cognitive behavior treatment than for the treatment involving parents or the whole family. And then he looked at these results are not published, but just presented, but he was willing to share them with me. Um, we lo he looked at a publication bias, and after controlling for publication bias, there was a significant better outcome for the child-only treatment. So does it mean that uh, we can simply ignore the parents if we treat children for anxiety disorders? Um, I think the answer is no. I think we need to see the commitment of the parents, see their stress, their love, uh, their despair when, they, uh, when their children are referred for severe anxiety disorder. We need as cl clinicians to hear their problem perception and their suggestions for solutions before we start the treatment with the child. We need to understand their views and also their different views uh, if there's a father and a mother or two, two parents uh, on the anxiety disorder problems of their children. And we need to understand their complementarities. So what different roles uh, can they play? How, um, uh, how can they both contribute? And therefore, we need to see them both. So we need to see both the mom and the dad as a clinician. I think it's always important to welcome them at the beginning and to thank them for their contribution. Always keep a connection when we work individually with a child. However, the child needs to be offered, of course, the best treatment we have. And the best treatment we have is individual child CBT. In the case of anxiety disorders, I'm not talking about other uh, disorders here. But you may consider having a parent, for example, watch part of the session if the child is in agreement with that, to a one-way screen or sitting into the session. And always see the parents during the assessment, as I already said, with and without a child, and ask parents for feedback about the treatment, whether they like the treatment, what they hear of the child, you can also invite parents at the end of a treatment and have the child present the results of what he or she did to uh, the parents.
I think one of the reasons why we don't need parents in treating children with anxiety disorder is because the good news is if we have a highly affected cognitive behavior therapy for child anxiety disorder. And the point is if you look at the effect sizes of adult child anxiety disorder, a meta-analytic study of Lars Göring O showed that they are less effective for adults than for children. So we have a very good treatment to treat children with uh, cognitive behavior therapy. To talk about um, parental involvement in younger versus older children. As you already saw, uh, especially in adolescent age, it may be a good idea to involve uh, parents because adolescents need their parents to, as, as a safe haven in order to explore the world and become independent. And so if they're in the parent-adolescent relationship, things are not going well, that might be a reason to involve the parents and see um, uh, how to improve those parent-adolescent relationships. Um, we tend to think that the younger the children are, the more we need the parents. Uh, that is not true, as our research showed. Uh, we also have a study with children as young as four years who can be treated in a group format without uh, their parents. And it was really a lot of fun to treat them uh, that way. They really liked it. And if you think about it, children at the age of four go on their own on school to school without their parents being in class. So it's not that the younger the child, the more we need the parents to be involved. So we already saw that parental anxiety disorder may actually be a contraindication to involve them in the treatment, uh, but it may be a reason, of course, to give them treatment for themselves for their own anxiety disorders. So my last point is, and then we have some time for questions and discussion, is uh, parental stress. So we talked a lot about parental anxiety disorder, but we didn't talk about parental stress. And parents can be highly stressed if their child has severe anxiety disorders. So child anxiety disorders can really increase the stress of the parents. And that stress of the parents can negatively impact their parenting. For example, they can easily kind of burst out, become angry, so show kind of a fight response, or become avoidant, show the fl flight response because of their own stress. And that stress, the stress of the parents, may actually maintain child anxiety. And so we can think about different ways of working with parental stress and not in the place of, I think, the child with an anxiety disorder always need to have a good child CBT because it works. It works for most children. But next to that, you can consider helping parents with their stress, for example, with a mindful parenting course. And at the moment, there is a study in Hong Kong uh, looking at the effect of mindful parenting in parents of children with internalizing uh, disorders. And then the focus is uh, more on the suffering of the parents, how to, uh, how to, how to uh, work with their own stress around their child's anxiety disorder. So this was my last uh, slide. Thank you very much. We have some time for questions, I think. <laughs>